Mademoiselle Elizabeth, merci for joining us. Miss Angeline said you requested to see me urgently. We have some serious matters to discuss, and I would like to waste no further time. Oh, yes, Detective. Still not quite myself. I was surprised when Monsieur Sterling hurried you to assist Madame Vandenbosch last night. I should not have avoided my duties for so long. The house does not stop because I'm feeling a little under the weather. That is true. But you cannot be expected to complete all your tasks if you are not in the right frame of mind. Honestly, Detective, it was best for me to not sit and wallow anymore. Yes, that is where he spent his last moments. Standing shoulder to shoulder with his fellow workers. The resulting riots were a terrible tragedy. One that I hope we will not have to see or experience again. Something that could have been avoided had the Major and his team done what was required of them. Nobody deserved to die that day. Not my Luke. Have you been able to uncover who the blackmailer is? The blackmailer's identity has been established, and they will pay the price for their crimes. Wonderful news, Detective. You can put it all behind you now. You must be thrilled. I would not say thrilled, knowing that such a close friend has betrayed us. Mademoiselle is correct. What I have learned over this weekend is that people are not always as they appear. While they may give an impression of being a friend or ally, they can in fact be something completely different. And, um, what of the Major's killer? Well, Mademoiselle, that is why I have asked you here now. I'm not quite sure what you want me to say, Detective. Your honest opinion is all I ask, and, s'il te plaît, do not hold back. No one else felt it necessary. We only spoke when there was something in the house to be done. We did not speak of interests or pastimes. You knew of his work with Monsieur de Silva? I only know what is required of me to know, and that is very little. But you were aware of his work as security at Monsieur de Silva's factory. I was. The factory your beloved Luke worked at, before he was cruelly taken from this world. Yes, Detective. Detective, what kind of question is that? It is a straightforward one. I... he... Mademoiselle, if there is something you wish to tell me, now is that time. I'm sorry, Detective, I just don't know how to answer it. Let us consider what we know of the Major. He fronted the militia that attacked the workers at the strike. You were aware of this? I... You finally had someone to blame for Luke's death. Someone conveniently located in the same house, alone in his study. No, Detective. It wasn't like that. Tell me what happened with the Major on the evening of his death. I was only in here trying to prove what I heard Mr. Becker say. I was going to report him, I swear. Miss Angeline, you believe me, don't you? I want to. I am still trying to understand it all myself. Why don't you start from the beginning? I was delivering Miss Angeline's dress to her room when I heard Mr. Becker's arguing with the Major in his study. They were ever so loud. I thought the whole house would have been listening to what they were saying. Mr. Beckers was talking about the factory strikes and how it was the Major's fault. He told him that if he didn't own up to his crimes, he would go to the newspapers. I cannot imagine the Major would have taken kindly to Monsieur Becker's threat. He didn't. He called him some rather uncouth names before Mr. Beckers left and went downstairs. I made sure to keep out of sight. After the altercation between the Major and Master Gideon, you went to speak with him outside, and I thought I could look around his study without anyone knowing. I had to know for sure. If it was true, he deserved to be held accountable. And did you find the proof you are looking for? I found a payment from Mr. De Silva, but there was nothing incriminating about that. I was so nervous. I felt like my heart was beating out of my chest. And then you saw the blackmail knot. I recognized the writing on the envelope. I couldn't believe it. How could he do such a thing to Angeline? 
to the family that had taken him in. Common sense would determine the Major was another victim of the blackmailer. If I'd have used common sense, I wouldn't have been snooping around alone in his study in the first place. I heard the footsteps in the hall, and before I could move, the Major was standing in front of me, demanding to know why I was going through his belongings without permission. I tried to come up with an excuse, but nothing came out, and when he saw the letter in my hand, it was like Dr. Jekyll turning into Mr. Hyde. I tried to move around him towards the door, but he hurled something towards me, and it crashed against the wall. That would explain the damage to the wall. I froze. I have never been so scared in all my life. I thought he was going to kill me there and then. And you thought you would beat him to it? Oh, Detective, you make it sound as though I had it all planned. He lunged forward and grabbed me by the arm. I tried to push him away, but he was too strong. His grip just got tighter and tighter. If only you had seen the look in his eyes, I dared not even scream. I saw the sheath on his belt. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't want to hurt him, but he wouldn't let go of me. So you took your opportunity to put an end to it all. I just wanted to get him off me. I didn't want to hurt him. I reached for it and I jabbed it at him. His grip instantly loosened and I ran straight out the door and didn't look back. You did not even look to see what state you had left him in? She had just been a typed detective. Oui, please. Continue. I ran down to the pantry looking for Rahana. She took one look at me and knew something was wrong. I explained to her what had happened and she went to find Archie. She said he would know what to do. We went back to the study and he was still lying there, motionless. Archie said that no one would believe me. That if someone like me killed someone like him, I would be sent straight to the gallows. He left the letter so you would find it. He said that if people knew what the Major was really like, then they wouldn't care what happened to him. So I am to believe that it was Monsieur Sterling and Mademoiselle Rayanna that cleaned the scene and orchestrated a plan that included a fake telephone call and dressing as the Major so that he may be seen. You had nothing to do with that. I swear I had no idea that is what they had done. Archie just told me to stay out of sight. I am no master criminal. Then Monsieur Sterling and Mademoiselle Rayanna will be charged for obstruction of justice and impeding my investigation. Please, detective. They were only trying to help me. If they wished to help you, they should have brought all of this to my attention immediately instead of committing more illegal acts. Surely you haven't forgotten what happened with Florette. She was only accused of stealing a bracelet. I killed a man. It is a day I have not forgotten, mademoiselle. Even for a moment. Without your help, I don't stand a chance. Please, Detective Poirot, you are the only one that can help me. Oh, Elizabeth, why didn't you come to me? I didn't think you would believe me. I felt so guilty. And when it was announced yesterday that he was a victim of the blackmailer, I wanted to tell you everything. I came to find you last night, Detective, but Archie stopped me. I'm sorry. Oh, yes? I don't know where it is. If you have been honest with me until now, I ask that you continue. I'm sorry, I really don't know. Archie dropped it out of the study window and he said he would deal with it. I couldn't bear to touch the thing. I need a moment.
cannot see the logic in. Order and method, that is the way to solve the problem. act on thought and fact. What a revelation! Myself. I didn't want to hurt him. He just wouldn't let me go. Oui, mademoiselle. Mademoiselle tells quite the harrowing story. I cannot imagine the Major acting in such a way. But Elizabeth could not make up such a story. After learning what I have about the Major's character this weekend, I would not question the lengths he would go to in order to keep his secret hidden. I know that you share a close bond with Mademoiselle Elizabeth, but you cannot allow your personal feelings to taint your belief of what took place. She has committed a terrible crime, but she will live with that for the rest of her life. She is not a cold-blooded killer. If what she says of the Major's attack is true, she acted in self-defense. And in the law's eyes, a crime has not been committed. I will do everything I can to make sure her story is heard and a fair trial is conducted. Mademoiselle, it is time I address the house. Are you sure? What will you say? What if they do not listen? I can assure you, they will. Elizabeth was right, though. She's just a servant. What if they... Mademoiselle, when Detective Poirot speaks, they will listen. Would you ask the guests to convene in the library? Of course. And what of the staff? I have told Monsieur Sterling to remain in the staff quarters with the others. When the authorities arrive, they shall be dealt with. You have been of great help to me throughout my investigation. And now that it is over, I have one final request. You only need to ask. While I am speaking with the guests in the library, would you watch over Mademoiselle Elizabeth in my room? You don't think she will try and escape, do you? In her position, I do not know what she might try. But I trust with you there. Any potential ideas of such a thing will be squashed. Detective, you have spent more time making us sit and wait for you than anything else. Madame Vandenbosch. If you think I have spent my time focused on anything besides uncovering the Major's killer, you are sorely mistaken. I'm sure you will be eager to share your findings with us then. All in good time, madame. Firstly, to understand the truth of what has occurred this weekend, one must know the timeline of events that not only preceded the Major's death, but succeeded. We are all well aware of what happened before, Detective. You can save your breath. You are only aware of what the guilty parties wanted you to believe. 
But now I shall apprise you to the true events. The reason for us all being here, you know. The altercation between Monsieur Demir and the Major, you know. The body of Monsieur Hagen was found while we were all sat enjoying a most delicious meal. That you also know. But what was kept from us all was that his body lay on the study floor for far longer than was thought. It was that servant! She found him! S'il te plaît, monsieur. It was indeed young Inga that found the Major's body lying lifeless in the study. So it was her! Monsieur, I will not allow for any further interruptions. Hmm. I return to the Major's body. If we are to believe the scene that we were presented with, the Major must have been killed during the first course of our meal, a meal that none of you left, even for a moment. Speaking in the evening, you all confirmed one another's alibis, and although there was doubt in the validity of some, I confirmed that they were indeed all true. What I could not understand was how a man came to be found dead, and every guest accounted for at the time of death. That is until I question the latter. Monsieur Beckers, I shall now allow you to speak. You saw the Major smoking a cigar in the snow. Is that true? It is. False. You saw what you were meant to see. Someone in the Major's coat, standing outside, giving the illusion that the Major was still very much alive. Monsieur da Silva, on the afternoon of the Major's death, do you recall hearing a telephone ring? Now that you mention it, I have not heard a single ring all weekend. Correct. The telephone lines have been down for the duration of our stay. Meaning the telephone call that was received and promptly directed to the Major's study was yet another act of trickery and deceit. But it did not end there. When I entered the study for the first time, it was obvious someone had already been there and falsified the scene to stage a burglary and clear away important evidence, including the murder weapon. What followed was an investigation that had already been hindered. But even those lengths were not enough to derail me for long. I think we have all had enough of your self-praise, Detective. Perhaps you would like to tell us who killed him now? Madame, as I'm sure you would expect, it is not as simple as that. What many of you do not know is the discussion that was had between the Major and Monsieur Beckers earlier that day. What has that got to do with anything? I told you I didn't kill him! That I know to be true. What you do not know is that it was not only his ears that heard your spoken words. I hope you are not implying I had something to do with it. No, madame. There was another. Mademoiselle Elizabeth. You are all aware that the Major was hired by Monsieur de Silva to front the security during the workers' strikes. What very few of you know is that it was the Major's order that instigated the vicious attacks on those unarmed men and resulted in numerous deaths, including Mademoiselle Elizabeth's fiancé, Luc. Monsieur Beckers confronted the Major, declaring that he was to hand himself in. That is what Mademoiselle Elizabeth overheard. Now, knowing the truth, she waited until the Major was away from his study. After he stepped outside following the confrontation with Monsieur Demir's fist, it looked to be the perfect opportunity, or so she thought. The Major returned and found her looking for the proof she required to hand him over to the authorities. If the maid bumped him off, why hasn't she been arrested? The events that followed in the study are not those of a cold-blooded murder but one of a young girl that had no other option but to protect her own life. Sounds to me, Detective, like you have taken a shine to this young girl and would rather protest her innocence than arrest her for murder, the crime she has committed. Jeez, this is gonna make for a juicy story. Mademoiselle, I ask you this. You have seen the Major's anger before, oui? What if I have? How do you think he would have reacted if someone was to find proof that he had committed a terrible act, and that if made public, 
would surely result in his incarceration. Exactement. It is quite the story you have told, Detective. But all I have heard is that Elizabeth overheard a conversation blaming the Major for her fiancé's death, and she murdered him in revenge. A servant killing a man that is as revered as he was. She will face the noose. I am not denying that a man has lost his life, but it is not the crime of murder that you all believe. While the Major did not deserve to die in such a way, it was his actions towards Mademoiselle Elizabeth that drove her to defend herself in any way she could. Mademoiselle Elizabeth will be punished, but we will let the law decide the severity of her punishment. She has played you like a fiddle detective, acting the innocent victim. She will be arrested and hanged for her crime, like every other cold-blooded killer. Uh, here, here. Give her what she deserves. The girl has got to pay for what she's done. Those of you that are calling for the hanging of Mademoiselle Elizabeth, have you forgotten the roles you played? Your actions have been far from innocent. Look, Detective, I see where you are going with this, but it's not going to work. So maybe the strikes were down to De Silva and Beckers. But don't try and drag me into their mistakes. Mademoiselle Conrad, if you are so confident of your innocence, perhaps we should begin with you. You don't need to imply it's only me that does. Ask any of my journalists, they'll say the same. Even if in the process people are hurt? You knew the situation surrounding the strikes and only sought to swell the anger in people and create further chaos. Mademoiselle, you so often have something to say. Now is not the time for silence. You really are delusional. Maybe you should just keep your theories and claims to yourself. You obviously have no idea what goes on in my world. I would say stick to honest police work, but it seems that it's not in your field either. Look, it's... Mademoiselle, I do not have time for your excuses. Do you wish to state your direct involvement, or should I? It's not... I... Okay, fine. Yes, the story was going nowhere. There was a deal on the table, and it was going to be done and dusted. Everything you said is true. I wanted the story. The scoop that would have blown the others out of the water. I never wanted anyone to get hurt. But I can see what I did wasn't right. I didn't think you had this side in you. I can see now why Angeline asked for you personally. You're not like other cops. It's clear it's the law and doing the right thing through and through with you. If you say it was self-defense, I believe you. We can't just forget what that girl has done. It's not Jackie's fault or any of ours that she decided to do what she did. Monsieur Beckers. You are the last person I expected to defend Mademoiselle Conrad. We talked only last night, and uh, correct me if I am wrong, but you have already declared the role you played. To me, at least. Yes, we talked. It's just not fair of you to attack Jackie like that, putting words in her mouth until she succumbs to your plan.
This is ridiculous. It was a peaceful strike. We only wanted what was deserved. Surely you do not think I sought to worsen the situation? Monsieur Beckers, you have taken the words from my mouth. Jackie was documenting everything to do with the strikes. She wanted our story to be heard and wanted to know how I was handling the negotiations. And they were handled by yourself? Naturally. If I cannot handle simple negotiations, I am not fit to be in the position I am in. I was only pushing for what my men deserved, what they needed. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, Detective. Surely you must know that. Nothing is ever simple, Detective. I'm sure you understand that better than anyone. You're right, Detective. I have tried so hard to deny my part, but I know only too well that my decisions led to the death of those men. I know I cannot excuse what I've done. I just want you all to know that I am not a hateful or malicious man. I only wanted to prove that I was the right man. I have lived in other shadows for so long. I thought that I would be able to finally step into the light and be the one that everyone remembered, not forgot. Monsieur de Silva offered me a deal and I turned it down. I thought I was doing right by the workers. But it was only myself I was thinking about. What more proof do you need? He said it himself. I made a generous offer to reach a resolution, and he turned his nose up at it. It was not that simple, though. We, oui, an offer was made. But Monsieur Beckers and the workers would never have been forced into that position had their working conditions been satisfactory to begin with. This is outrageous! Do you plan on blaming everyone for doing their jobs? I suppose it makes you feel better about yourself, doesn't it? It may be a big deal to you, but I am used to workers not being happy with something. And most of the time, that unhappiness is directed at me. When you're in charge of your own factory, you understand. I handle the situation the best I could. If you think otherwise, maybe you have proved us all right that you aren't the great detective you claim to be. I'm the next target, am I? You are certainly not making any friends here, detective. We can all see right through you. Whatever you have to say, we have known each other for years, and it will take more than a young, cocksure detective to waver their support of me. Monsieur da Silva, you seem to have forgotten our previous conversations. I recall them just fine, thank you. A police officer trying to manipulate facts to fit his own agenda. Shocking. Is that what you plan to do? Accuse us all of something until we feel enough guilt? that we agreed to allow the girl to walk free. The events that led to the Major's murder are not as simple as you have tried to convince yourself. I have uncovered what initiated both the murder of your workers and of the Major. It is you that refuses to accept the truth. Apparently anyone can become a detective now. I really don't know how you gained your title. Through order and... Th order? 
There is no order in beating down who you consider suspects until they have no other option but to admit something. Guilt. Monsieur da Silva, you have stood steadfast, and your opinion on your involvement has not wavered. Detective, you would do well not to anger my friends. It was not my intention. I only want those responsible to be held accountable for their actions. The Major's death does not fall on one person alone. Does your position on Mademoiselle Elizabeth's guilt remain the same? Even after all your attempts, Detective, Felix was still murdered. Self-defense or not, she chose to hide what she had done because she knew what she had done was wrong. And she will be punished for it. It was not choice to hide anything, Madame. If in her position, I ask what would you have done? The Major has already furiously thrown an object at you, barely missing your head, and now has hold of your arm. But I wouldn't have driven a knife into him, that I can tell you for sure. She is no fool. She intended to kill, not to defend. Quite presumptuous of you to assume violence is in his nature. Putting my own feelings towards the Major aside, he was not an honorable man, at least at some time in his life. He must have been for you to allow him in your house for so many years. So, even you confirm he had a history of aggression. I'm sure that is none of my business. Likewise, it is none of yours. The Major shot and killed a number of unarmed prisoners as they were bound and terrified, posing no threat. His actions are unforgivable and should not be defended by anyone. You judge him so harshly, but I return the question. What would you have done in his position? He had made mistakes, I will not deny that. In those moments when a decision had to be made, it fell to him and he did what he saw fit. S'il te plaît, madame. I ask that you consider everything you know of the Major carefully. He was not always like that. The man that I called a friend would never have done what he has. I cannot allow another innocent person to be punished for his vicious and barbarous behavior. You have seen the Major act in a similar manner as I described before, haven't you? What was the outcome then? You have convinced me that I am wrong in both my opinion on Elizabeth's punishment and in the friendships I keep. Is that not enough for you? Not when a potential crime has been committed, and I fear an innocent party may have been punished for it. He was just a boy. I told him to stop, but he was like a wild animal. The confrontation with Mademoiselle Elizabeth was not the first time he has come close to killing another. It was following the officer's ball. A young man, no older than 16, stopped us on the street, begging for some change. Felix pushed him away, but he was persistent. He only wanted a few coins. Like a flash, Felix snapped and wouldn't let go of him. He would not stop punching him. I, I have never seen anything so brutal. But he was never charged for the attack. Felix called the captain at the station and 
said that the boy had tried to rob him and he was merely defending himself. The boy was thrown behind bars without a second thought. It was a full week before the bruises on Felix's knuckles finally faded. And even after witnessing such a brutal assault, you still support him? You still believe that he had not attacked Elizabeth? The days following, he showed no signs of remorse, no apology to him or to me. I blamed it on the amount he had had to drink. But when you began talking about him finding Elizabeth in his study, I somehow knew it had happened again. Had you been open about the Major's temper, this could all have been avoided. When you tell the courts the truth, Mademoiselle Elizabeth's self-defense plea cannot be ignored. Just when I thought I could not see a more spineless move. Excuse me? You allowed a bully and thug to remain in your house and endanger your family. I'm sorry, Margot, but I am struggling to understand why you have involved yourself in this affair. I'm surprised you can hear me way up there on that high horse of yours. How dare you speak to me in that way? Who I decide to keep in my house is my decision and no one else's. I can see that. Murderers, thieves and extortionists are all acceptable, it seems. Countess, I have talked at length of the Major's death, but not the reason for my invitation in the first place. When I last gathered you all together, I spoke of a blackmail ring that was rife in the area, and then of the letter that the Major had received. Mademoiselle Angeline requested my help personally after she received such a letter threatening her family name. She felt I was the only one that could uncover the truth. And uncover the truth, I have. Get on with it, detective. Who dared try and extort my family and then have the gall to allow me to welcome them into my home? If it was not for the honesty of a young servant, I would perhaps still be looking for the cup. For goodness sake, it was me. Margot, how could you? While it looked as though the Countess was helping the young women at the shelter, she was in fact only finding them positions of employment in wealthy homes to gather information on them and learn secrets that she would ultimately be able to use against them. Monsieur da Silva fell victim to her network of moles and was in turn blackmailed. It was quite the prosperous setup you had, knowing that they would not be prepared to lose their social standing if a secret was to find its way from where it had been hidden for so long. That cannot be true, Margo. How could you do such a cruel thing? That is rich, coming from you. You are one of my oldest friends. High and mighty Madame Vandenbosch. You think you can do what you wish, when you wish it, and there will be no repercussions. You are as bad as all of them. If I do not get a straight answer out of you, I will march you to the police station myself. I'm surprised it took the Major this long to start living with you. He must have been on the edge for some time. How dare you speak to me like that? In my own home! A home you share with the father of your daughter for so many years, and she still remains none the wiser. You have no right! Maman! Angeline! Have you heard what she has admitted to? She is merely trying to make herself... Is what she says true? Felix, he was my father? That is the secret that the letter was talking about, isn't it? You told me that we had nothing to hide. Detective Poirot, were you aware of this? Oui, mademoiselle. But it was not my place to repeat. I don't understand. What about father? 
Your mama betrayed the love of a good, honest man and played away behind his back and then kept it hidden for all these years like a lady of the night with her client list. Don't you say no more. Angeline, I... I... Did Felix know? This is not an appropriate conversation. He knew, dear girl. He knew the whole time. It is only dear Edwin that was blind to their deceit. You will not talk of him like that. You will not talk of him at all. If I don't, who will? You never deserved him. You don't even deserve the memory of him. Countess, there is something that you still have not explained. What more is there for her to say? How long were you in love with the Viscount for? Marco? Is that true? We were destined to be together. And then you turned up. And I was all but forgotten about. But you were nothing more than friends. And you made sure of that, didn't you? From the day you arrived, it was all about what you wanted and what you had to do to get it. You didn't consider Edwin at all. He was just a purse to you. I loved my husband, and I miss him every day. Loved him enough to stray? Both of you, no more. Please, Angela, let me explain. Maman, I do not wish to hear anything else from you. Not even your own daughter wants to hear your lies anymore. Cassandra van den Bosch, all alone. How dare you! While I feel a sense of satisfaction and pride in solving both cases, there is still a part of me that is reluctant to revel in triumph. I am content with the unmasking of Countess de Vos as the blackmailer, and knowing that she will pay for her crimes. But it is the justice for Mademoiselle Elizabeth that worries me. She will stand in a court of law, and I can only hope that they can see she acted in self-defense. I must trust that our legal system and justice will prevail, and a fair sentencing will be given. In protecting her own life, she took the life of another. Perhaps the guilt she must live with is a greater punishment than any sentence she can receive. Countess de Vos was taken from Nemozine House in cuffs and placed under arrest. Although she initially tried to plead her innocence, Inga, along with a number of other girls that the Countess had found employment for, came forward and made full statements. She was charged with five counts of blackmail and extortion and sent to a house of corrections where she will have a new life to become accustomed to. Monsieur Sterling and Mademoiselle Rayana were also reprimanded for their participation. While they may not be facing time in prison, tampering with a crime scene and obstruction of a police investigation are certainly not something that houses and new employers will look positively on. Mademoiselle Angeline finally became Madame Demir, and together they took up residence in England, where Monsieur Demir continues to support and fight for fairness and equality in London. I am happy to say that we have remained in contact. And Madame Demir has become a regular correspondent of mine. And the latest joyous news is that they are expecting a child of their own. Madame Van den Bosch showed compassion that I had not seen in her before. She stood in court and gave a truthful and genuine character reference of Elizabeth, as well as describing the Major and the atrocious crimes he had committed. After Madame Van den Bosch's secret was revealed to the world, her position in the social hierarchy was no more disappearing in a moment. While she still resides in Belgium, I believe she has had to adapt to a far more modest way of life. A humbling experience for her, I am sure. Following her actions in the courtroom, Angeline believed that her maman still had a place in her life. On 
Though they are on different sides of La Manche, they remain in contact. Mademoiselle Conrad left Nemozine House the same way she entered, confident in herself and audacious in her opinions. Her report of the Major's murder at the house and the surrounding blackmails became one of the most talked about stories of the year. While there were certain details of her own involvement that did not make it to print, she was really quite complimentary about the detective at the heart of the case. Monsieur de Silva tried to continue in his position as factory owner and business entrepreneur, but after his accounts and business dealings were investigated following the details of his blackmail being made public in Mademoiselle Conrad's article, his illustrious business empire began to crumble and is now facing an international corporate investigation. Monsieur Becker stepped down from his position as union leader, accepting that he was no longer fit to represent the workforce that in his words he had let down on a scale of unmeasurable proportion. Although he is no longer the voice of the workers, he continues to support them from behind the scenes. Monsieur Zachariah and his brother made amends, and returning to his family home, and after sobering up, he was able to find the help that he required. I understand that he is now helping fellow soldiers with similar conditions. And Mademoiselle Elizabeth, she stood before a court, and while the proceedings were deemed controversial, the charges against her were dropped and the reasoning of self-defense was accepted by the presiding judge. Madame Van den Bosch's testimony, along with Mademoiselle Angeline's declaration of her good character, was enough to show that it was not in Elizabeth's nature to act in such a violent way. The abundance of evidence against the Major and his violent and cruel nature, including his appalling acts during the strikes and the war, was more than enough to prove that Mademoiselle Elizabeth had no other option in that situation but to defend herself in any way that she could. With the new arrival of Madame and Monsieur Demir's child next year, they have agreed to give Elizabeth the opportunity to return home to England and take up a position in their home as nanny. The death of Elizabeth's beloved Luke has been at the center of everything. Had those in positions to help not acted with only themselves in mind, perhaps he would still be alive today and the Major would have paid the price for his own crimes in the eyes of the law, not at the blade of a knife. The blood of Major Felix Egan will remain on Elizabeth's hands, a stain that wherever she is and whatever she may do, she will never be able to wash clean. However, it will remain as a reminder to not only her, but all of us, of what we as human beings are capable of to protect ourselves. We all have something that may be considered shameful or sinful, and it is how we deal with it that shows our true character. Those involved in the riots, the workers' deaths, and the Major's killing believe themselves to be untouchable. Whether it was from their social standing or their confidence in themselves, they learnt that everyone is accountable for their actions. There is no exemption because of the suit you wear or the money in your bank account. There is no price to a man's life. It cannot be bought or traded or discarded. No man is better than another, including Detective Hercule Poirot.